Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Wednesday webinar here at GeoGebra. My name is Tim Brzezinski. I'm the Professional Development Director at GeoGebra. And hi, I'm Monique. I'm the Lee Kirkham Designer at GeoGebra. And joining us here is special guest, Robert Kaplinski. Hey, everyone. Hi. So uh, tonight, Monique, what are we talking about tonight here? Can we get that uh, thing up there? We're talking about using GeoGebra to design open middle problems. Now, open middle is an awesome movement. It's going on in math, math education, has for the last few years. Uh, it's a great thing. And Robert Kaplinski is a mathematics educator and co-founder of Open Middle. And uh, Robert, would you please take a few minutes just to briefly describe what Open Middle actually like is? Yeah, thank you for this opportunity. So I thought that what would be a really easy way to get a better understanding for what Open Middle is like is to show you a problem. So let me kind of give you an idea of what that looks like. So the problems tend to look like this with boxes and digits that you can place in the box. So let me walk you through this problem and talk to you a little bit about why this is perhaps different than what you experienced when you were a student. So it says using the digits five, six, seven, and eight, exactly one time each, pick an expression and place a digit in each box to create the greatest possible product. Now, you could have kids who rock multiplication, maybe even have a calculator, but this problem can be really challenging. Like, what if you're just randomly picking numbers blindly out of a bag? So you put like seven and five and eight and six, like, is that the greatest possible product? Or what if you put, I don't know, six and seven and eight and five? Is that the greatest possible product? Again, you can be amazing at multiplication. You can have a calculator and still have really no idea how to approach this. Eventually, kids might tap into their conceptual understanding. They might realize, well, maybe uh, we'll use the greater digits in the greater place values and do eight, seven, six, and five versus, I don't know, eight, seven, six, and five. Like, how do you know which of those has a greater value? And so you have these opportunities to really think deeply about the mathematics. Kids might even approach it geometrically. Like imagine if we were doing the same problem, but with four, three, two, and one. Kids might think of it like a rectangle. They might think, well, okay, 432 by one is one way of doing it. But if we did 431 by two, now again, these are not drawn to scale, but you can see, even if you don't do the math, like do no multiplication. If you just think conceptually, like mm -hmm. one 432 is not going to be nearly as much as two 431s or, I don't know, three 421s. And so you can start to realize this pattern that the closer you get to both sides being equal and making the rectangle into a square, the greater the value. And so kids might approach it instead of looking at it like they might realize, okay, there's no way it's going to be the three digit time the one di times the one digit. Let's just right. look at a two digit times a two digit. But even there, it's not easy. Like, is it 85 times 76 the same thing as 86 times 75? Like, how do you know? Like, you could just, you. I want you to imagine that you have students who could rock the socks off of an entire worksheet of problems like this, but get, a, I'm sorry, of traditional two digit by two digit multiplication. They'd be fine with that. But if they get stuck with this problem, it can show you that there might be some gaps in their understanding. Like, how do you know which of these is closer to having the greatest possible product. And you start to even think, okay, what is the difference in the two side lengths? What is the absolute value of that difference, right? One, the first one has an absolute value of nine in terms of the difference. And the other one has a difference of an absolute value of 11. And you start to realize that that top one, the 85 times 76 is actually gonna be closer to being a square and will have a greater possible product. So what's important to realize about this is that where does that word open middle come from? People might say, this is a great open-ended problem. Guess what? This problem is not open-ended. It's actually closed-ended. So let's talk about that. Problems have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now, in this case, everyone began with the same problem. So the beginning is closed. It's a closed beginning problem. And the ending is closed as well. There's exactly one right answer. The answer is 85 times 76. What's open is the middle. There were many ways kids could approach it, guess and check, using conceptual understanding, thinking about it geometrically. And that's right. what we love about open middle problems is that because of open, the middle is open, you can have all these wonderful conversations about the strategies that kids might use to figure it out. So that's what I love about open middle problems. That's awesome. Thank you, Robert. Uh, thanks so much for sharing. And 
even still, it's almost like you're taking the um, the like like a synthesis kind of approach where it's like it's it's, it's very DOK. It's higher level, right? Where kids are yeah, just so, creating so and a lot of problems tend to be depth of knowledge level two and three almost exclusively. Uh, mm -hmm. But I mean, what I found is that kids love doing these problems. They build really deep conceptual understanding. They lead to great conversations and they reveal hidden misconceptions that, yep. you know, you didn't know that were there. So uh, yeah. a lot of teachers are using them, whether they're in person or remotely. And, and I love GeoGebra in the connection to open middle because it really helps you visualize it in ways that maybe you didn't think about it before. Absolutely. Well, we know you got to get going to dinner. So thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Yeah. Have a good evening. So you, too. Um, you got it. So we're going to actually take the rest of the hour here to actually walk through the creation of an open middle problem in GeoGebra. Now, GeoGebra isn't the only platform you could use to create a digital analog of an open middle problem. There's several others. But GeoGebra, you know, working in the app, there's actually you actually could do it pretty creatively. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna take one open middle problem. We're gonna model it tonight in GeoGebra. We'll build it, and later on, Monique will demonstrate GeoGebra Classroom. If you haven't seen it yet, we'll take the we'll we'll take the problem that we plan out right now and create, and we will turn it into an engaging lesson towards the end, uh, right over here. So uh, buckle up. We're gonna get on the journey. We're gonna rock and roll. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen here. So let me uh, stream my sharing window. So let me stop. Let me take this out of here. And let me uh, let me put this back in here. All right, I haven't played with this in a while. But let me uh, stop screen sharing, and then I'll share it again, and we'll go. So um, right here, we'll do the entire screen. All right, so uh, we've got the fractal thing going on. Can you see this, Monique? Are we uh, screen sharing? Yep, looks good. All right, awesome. So the problem that we're going to create in GeoGebra tonight is this one right here. This one I got right off Open Middle Site, uh, created by uh, sorry, created by uh, Daniel Torres Rangel. And here it is, all right? Here are the directions. Use the digits one to nine at most one time each, using the digits one to nine at most one once. Fill in those boxes so that the points make a parallelogram, or so those points are vertices of a parallelogram, right? Now just think of the, the, the problem involved here, especially for those of you that are teaching math remotely or fully remotely, or maybe you're a teacher in a hybrid district, all right? Actively engaging students with working through a problem like this, if all you have is paper, is very difficult. But we can make an analog of this in GeoGebra where kids just simply move points along the grid and we could form the quadrilateral that connects them. And they could use the tools of GeoGebra to justify whether or not that quadrilateral they create is a parallelogram. Okay, so I'm going to take that. We'll, we'll go back here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go right to GeoGebra site. Okay. And if you have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. You're more than welcome to do so. However, we, uh, because of the time constraint, we won't be able to answer every single one, unfortunately. But um, always remember that even in a live video afterwards, you could always take the red dot and go back a few seconds just in case you miss something and not watch it live. But what we're going to do is we're going to build this in the GeoGebra Classic app right here. Now, just as an FYI, if you go over to app downloads on the right side, right on the left side here, there are several GeoGebra apps, very powerful, and many many uh, uh, authors like to use the GeoGebra Classic 5 here. This is uh, the software version of GeoGebra, all right? But I'm gonna, we're not going to create in software because I'm going to assume there are viewers right now that only have a Chromebook. And if you have a Chromebook, so, uh, software is useless. So we're going to create it in the online app. We're going to create in the online Classic app right here, all right? That's GeoGebra Classic 6, which you can download as an app to your computer, work offline, fine. But we're going to use the online app, uh, GeoGebra Classic. So let's go back to home, and we'll go to GeoGebra Classic, which is right over here in the middle, and we'll uh, get going. So this um, this is a classic app. The, for those of you longtime users of GeoGebra, you are used to uh, this appearance, right? There are newer apps as well, but we're going to stick here. Now, before we even get started, I want to actually set some like preliminaries here, right? Thinking of like, wait, what, what did the problem actually ask? And in fact, if I go here for a second, give me a second, this screenshot, I can actually take and bring it right into the GeoGebra app here so I can see what I'm doing, okay? So uh, I can actually uh, kind of make this a little smaller. I'm going to get rid of it in a second, just so we can remember what the problem's actually saying, right? Right there. So now, think about it. 
we need to actually have uh, uh, points be co have coordinate integers. So in order to do that, I actually want to, first of all, go to, um, I'm going to right click in uh, in here and go to the graphics settings. You see that little um, that little gear is a settings gear. You can always right click in the GeoGebra app, right click, you can go to graphics here, or you can go to the three bars here and then go to settings right here. Okay, so now in order to do this more effectively, I'm gonna change the font size to be like super big so you can really see my screen really well, okay? And by the way, uh, teachers, um, if you have students whose English is not a first, uh, their primary language, you have like over 73 languages you can choose from here in any GeoGebra app. Very, very powerful, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's awesome. So now um, over here, now if I go to the, um, if I go to this, there's the settings right there. If I go to this uh, screen right here, this view, um, the graphics you set up where it says X axis, the X axis tab, I am going to lock a distance to one. I want the X axis to scale by ones. I'm gonna to go to the Y axis. I want that to scale by ones, okay? And when it comes to the grid, I'm going to choose, um, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the minor grid lines, so I like to pick major. That looks a lot cleaner to me, okay? I mean, I, I, I make a big deal with aesthetics. I mean, to me, the appearance is everything. But again, you can't judge a book by its cover, but a lot of people, when they see an app, they tend, they do, you know? So uh, going with that logic there, we can go so, ahead. Tim, could you repeat uh, why we're doing this again? Why we're changing the grid settings again? Uh, we are setting, we're changing the grid settings because this problem right here from open middle site, which we're going to build here, wants us to use the digits one to nine at most one time each. So basically we want to just simply have, uh, it would be nice for students to just simply have a, something that's automatically scaled by ones. Mm. If that makes sense. And to make, and to make it even, to make it even better, if I go to the point tool, right. And I'll just plot a point here, right. And I'll go back to hit the move arrow to move it around. Notice it's kind of like uh, C cannot, but the problem says it has to be an integer. So we could force that to be the case. If we actually go up here to that little uh, style bar, we'll see what the, the, the magnet symbol is. Right now it's on automatic, but if, if I select fixed to grid, watch this. Select, choose that option right there. And what will happen is C is now forced to be at a lattice point or a corner of a square. See that, and that, it, it makes it more bumpy of a movement, right? But it's stuck having integer coordinates, whether I like it or not, mm. okay? So that that's kind of why I, uh, I built a lot of these this way. So let me get this off to the side there so we can keep that for reference later. I know for my OCD is kicking in, it's kind of making me upset that it's not straight. Okay, level. So there we go. So let me delete this. So now keep in mind the other condition that has to be true here. They have to be from one, the coordinates have to range from one to nine. So I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute, hold on a second here. If I'm gonna make a digital analog of this that's easy for students to use, it might be best to make a point, make four points that are locked in that region, right? Well, what region are you talking about? Well, isn't the first region really X greater than or equal to zero, right? Well, again, I'll show you how I type that in there. I just type in X, type the greater than sign, then hit equals on your computer. If you, if you put an equals right after that, it becomes that x greater than or equal to zero, right? It'll actually plot that inequality. We know that the, the points of that quadrilateral have to be in this region, right? But what's the highest it can get? It says there, the highest that the coordinate could ever get is nine. So when I build this in GeoGebra, I'm thinking x has to be less than or equal to nine. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're covering the whole plane here and the intersection is what we're talking about. Wait a minute, y has to also be greater than or equal to zero, doesn't it? And what's the other inequality? Y less than or equal to nine, right? And so right here, we see that we, we see that the four points that we're going to plot in just a minute have to lie in this region over here. That's the intersection, is it not? Mm -hmm. So think of how we write intersection. And it's the, it's the caret symbol, which you could find, again, this little keyboard is sometimes hard to see for people, but there is uh, the Greek, uh, there is a Greek keyboard down here where the, right there, uh, and is in there, something like right here. But I tend to get a little lazy when I make these. So instead, what I do is I actually uh, take a shortcut here, and I'll show you it right now. It's A. If you put a double and like that, it's hard to see. But if I hit the and button twice, and and, it makes it appear automatically. 
B and and C and and whoops I did exponent C and and D right and look at this now E is the E is the gold mine right there that's where I'm going to plot the points so right here I'm going to turn everything off except for E right I'm going to turn off the regions I used to make those right there and now what I'm going to do I'll bring this up here a little bit. Now what I'm going to do is actually use the point on object tool right here. This will put a point on a curve on a line, but it'll also put a point in a region if you ask it to. Again, GeoGebra's tools are very powerful. They will do what you tell them to do. All right. So point on object. And so we need four points. One, two, three, four. Those are going to, those are going to be my four vertices right there. So now I can go and I, I can go ahead and hide E. And actually, I could take all this here. In fact, I want to make those bigger because they're hard to they're hard to see for me. I'm actually going to hold down the shift key and actually select whoop, um, right here. If I actually take um, not the other app there, but if I hold down control, whoop, uh, the control button here, if I hold down control, I can select a bunch at once. Right click right here. If I right click, I can go to the settings for all four of those. And now I can choose to make those points super large so they're easy to view. See what I mean? Um, I'll show you right here. See how they're, okay, prove me a liar now. I might have to just do this one at a time. Maybe it's a bug, I don't know. But there we go, make it bigger. And I'm gonna show the the, va the value. That's six to eight. I'll show the name and value just to be um, easier. And I'll make that black so it's easier for everybody to see. Again, just some some style here, there. And then we'll show the value, or name and value, we should say, here. We'll do the same thing. And um, and right here. And value. Okay. Oh, name and value, sorry. Because I want to see their names as I'm building it. So now... Well, let's actually you let's actually form the quadrilateral now. See, I'm I'm trying to move point D up above and I can't. And why can't I? Because I forced it to be in that region that we made right there. So this is this is automatically adhering to the constraints of this open middle problem that we just dragged in right here. They are integers, they're digits one through nine, and we're we're keeping it that way. Um actually, did I make it zero? I did, rats. I just totally realized I, I actually let zero. This is it's supposed to stop at one. Not at zero. So when I make a mistake, yeah, Tim, is there a way to change that uh, without having to remake everything? Absolutely. I'll just change the original equality right here. Let's make this x greater than or equal to one, and we'll make this y greater than or equal to one. See a, b, and c, and d. Now, if I look, if I turn that bubble on right there, see, the points are forced to be in that square, whether I like it or not. Okay, eight by eight, right? So that, and that's what, that's what the open middle problem is making us do. So I'll hide that. And actually, if I right click in the graphics altogether, go to graphics one more time for the X axis, I can just show the positive direction because negatives aren't even needed here. The Y axis, I'll show the positive direction only, All right? In GeoGebra, there's a way to do, you could tell, there's a way to do anything in GeoGebra, everything. You just, again, a lot of the key is, the hard part is just finding it sometimes, mm -hmm. right? But it's there. And whenever I don't know something, there's always stuff in GeoGebra I don't know still, I just Google it. And I find it. All right. Um, so now let's use the polygon tool right here to actually uh, to, to actually form that polygon. And if any longtime users of Geometry Sketch are watching tonight, right, uh, you know that you make a polygon by going in a consecutive kind of circular order. We'll bring it right back here, like so. And I'll put the move arrow so I can now move this thing around. Now, again, I don't like those labels so much. So what I like to do here is I'm going to right click on the polygon. I'm going to format it separately. So for the style, I like to make it very thin, right? And I'm gonna basic, I'm gonna turn off, uh, there's no label showing, which is good. But now what I like to do is I like to take thick black segments right here, and I like to literally like just kind of do this. And in fact, with the segment tool showing here, I'm actually gonna choose to, by default, I'm gonna make them kind of thicker, and I'm gonna actually turn the label off. Many people in GeoGebra don't realize this, but if you actually highlight a tool here, you can actually, uh, you can actually, what's the right word? You can actually uh, style every future object of that that you create by just modifying the settings here while you're highlighting it. 
So I'm going to make it hidden here. So watch this. I'll do DE, much thicker. Again, it's looking a lot nicer. We'll make a much prettier color there too. Okay. Now this has line thickness, what? Uh, this has thickness eight. So I'll go here and make sure that has thickness. It does. So we're good. Okay. And so let's choose a different color. See the color palette? Style guide's right here. I love that style bar. We can make it kind of purple, make it a little pretty, make it darker, right? So there we go. Okay. So here is, see now students have a, a digitally, we have, we have a digital analog, a resource that we could do with. And notice how this problem is way more challenging, right? Because digits are not allowed to repeat. We have to use the digits one to nine at most one time each. So basically the standard setup of the parallelogram like this, right? Or a rectangle is not going to fly because obviously the wide coordinate repeats here. This is no good. Okay. So next key thing is, is uh, to let GeoGebra do, you know, it's not going to spit back right or wrong. We're not going to program it that way because we need to have, we need to have students reflect on what they're, what they're doing here. Okay. I'm going to delete this Monique. I think we know what the problem is by now. All right. So let's get rid of that and that clean it up. So now the key thing, the key factor is that digits are not allowed to repeat. So how do we let the students know if digits repeat? Because there's a, there's eight values here to keep track of. Well, think, let's think statistics for a second. And feel free to type it in the chat. I know, Monique, I, can't, I cannot see the, um, the comments coming. I know you can. But when we have a data set, if we have any repeats, what is that called? Let's think of it that way. If there's any repeated digit in a data set, then another name for that is simply a what? Jeopardy. <laughs> we have mean, median, and mode, right? So we're gonna we're gonna form a data set of all of these. Now look at the, the points are named C, uh, C, F, E, uh, D, E, F, and C, actually. C, D, E, F. Sorry. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a data set here. The X coordinate of C, the Y coordinate of C. In GeoGebra, that's how you indicate coordinates of a point. Uh, you Desmos enthusiasts know it'll be it would be called C dot X. You know what I mean? But in GeoGebra, that's how you for, you uh, write it here. Okay, X of C, Y sub C, and then uh, X of B, Y of B. Right? There's four of our points. Again, we're making a data set, and we're going to use GeoGebra to check if there are any repeats. Because the problem says one to nine at most one time each. So X of D, Y of D, X of E, Y of E. And what's the what was it? C, D, E, and F. X of F and Y of F right there. If there were a bunch of points, I would do it differently, but there's only eight. So again, the X and Y coordinate of F, X and Y coordinate of E, X and Y coordinate of D, and last but not least, the X and Y coordinate of C. So I'm gonna hit enter. And that's my data set right there. Those are those are all the coordinates that I see. You see how one is repeated? We can easily see that. So but I'm not going to, I just want the mode of that data set. Isn't it just the mode of L1? Here we go. If there are no, if there are no repeats, if all of these digits are different, there technically is no mode, right? So it would be technically, it would be the empty set. So in GeoGebra, we use uh, the, the, the command length, spit out the length of L2. And that's, that's what GeoGebra calls K. And oh, this is bad. K cannot have a length. What's the ideal length? of this set here. If no digits repeat, which is what we want, the, the, there has to be no mode. Therefore, its length has to be zero, right? And so I'm going to make myself a text. I'm going to make myself a mental note when I'm programming, right? So, so K equals the, uh, the number of elements or the number of modes, say, even, number of elements uh, in uh, the mode of L1. Whenever I program writing GeoGebra, I always write myself some notes on the side that I delete later. Okay. So watch what, so I can use GeoGebra to actually uh, give a warning prompt to students here or a notification prompt. So watch this, right? If K is equal, equal to zero. Now, some of you are scratching your heads. I'll stop right there. Why do you have a double equals? I'll go back. K equal, equal zero. Two, e one equals, if I just wrote this, I'm just saying, hey, k is equal to zero. But if I were to type a double equal that's equal equal, GeoGebra thinks of that as a Boolean operator. That is going to output true or false, right? 
it's going to output true if if k if k is equal to zero it's going to output true but if k is not equal to zero it's going to output false so remember a double equal is, is just like a greater than or a less than it's 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 gonna it's gonna like it's gonna compare it's gonna compare and say oh is it you know so if k equal equals zero then um no digits repeat exclamation mark exclamation mark oh there we go else this is like if then else if 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 there's no mode if if there's no elements in the set this will have length zero right therefore i'm going to tell people no digits repeat otherwise i'm going to say um at least one coordinate repeats at least one Yeah, so okay, at least one. Let me just hide this here. Oh, hang on. Let me just delete that for a second. Ah, you know what I should do? In the meantime, I should save this. That's important. So open middle sample. Okay. It's you should get in the habit of saving every uh, every few minutes because unlike Google Drive, it doesn't do that. So we're saved. We're good, right? Just in case I accidentally went back in the browser there. But K is the number of elements in uh in mode one there, that's the text I put there. But now, so let's try this again. If k equal equals zero, let's say no repeats. Otherwise, I'm gonna say you have at least one repeat. Something like that. So if if there's no if there's no repeats, I'm gonna get that message. If there are repeats, that means k is not equal to zero, then it's gonna let me know. So check it out. Right now, it says I have at least one repeat. There it is. So this is not really thinking for students. It's actually, I put it there as a convenience for students because this is a lot of stuff to keep track of here, right? So right here, you see what I mean? So let me actually make no repeats. Like one, let me put it one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. We'll put this at five, six, and seven, eight. You see how the see how the sign changed to no repeats right there, but now as soon as I get a repeated digit, you see how that sign changes. So that again, that just serves as a as a notification to students that hey buddy, you might have a parallelogram, but you got some repeats there. Okay, and so that's that's kind of the gist of it. And so now the rest of it is just positioning on the on the part of the student and using the tools of GeoGebra to finally justify why the quadrilateral is a parallelogram. Okay, but we're Monique and I are going to have you do this in GeoGebra Classroom. We're, we're going to have you participate with, in this in just a little bit. But first, we got to do a little bit of housekeeping here. There are a lot of tools here, tons of tools. And a lot of teachers have told me in years past, they say, Tim, GeoGebra, I realize it's powerful, but my gosh, it's like I look at all the vast numbers of tools here, and it's like I get a panic attack. And I can understand that. Okay, but um, again, you take baby steps and going forward with it. And that's why I suggest working in the newer apps. Uh, it, oops, in the newer apps that have the blue background, you don't see all the tools at once. They actually kind of progress as you hit more. And so it's not as overwhelming. Okay. So let's actually give students only the tools that they need because in order to justify why it's a parallelogram, right? There's a lot of tools. So by going up to, you can actually customize the toolbar. You can give only the tools that you want students to use. That's something else we'll show you how to do here. All right, so to do that, we want to go to the menu here, scroll down the tools right here. And we're going to actually hit customize. And all of the tools are here. So these are all the tools that people see. And every again, there's a lot more underneath each one. So if you have ever watched that TLC show hoarders when they have so much stuff in the house, what do they do at first? They, they take everything out, right? They everything out again. You want to clean up a room that's just cluttered. You got to almost like take everything out and then think, organize. What do I need? What can I get rid of? Right? It's healthy. So here, I do the same thing. I think, what are kids going to need to justify it's a parallelogram? Well, every tool I need, I, I need the move arrow. Definitely, I got to move points around, of course, right? Mm -hmm. But how else can I justify this? I mean, I might want to give students the line tool. I might want to give them the seg some kids may want to form diagonals and see where they intersect. So I might I might choose the intersect tool right here. I could plot the diagonals, see where they intersect and measure, see if they bisect each other. That's one way. All right. I also might uh, I think of, I, I might give them the angle tool. 
they may want to measure a pair of opposite angles. Right? We'll give them the angle tool there. How about the slope? That's a oh, I love that one. Using slopes of I mean again, there's a lot, there's a lot of tools here, and just those those few that are right there. And I also love to give kids the trash can as well so they can delete stuff. Okay. So if I want to measure, uh, if, if I want to simply measure a pair of slopes of opposite segments, I can do that. I can measure the angles of the, of the quadrilateral. I'm giving students a, a lot of means in order, in order to, so they can try to do this here. And maybe I'll put the point tool up there. Sometimes I find that, you know, I, I miss a point accidentally. So I always encourage teachers to try to do it yourself first, you know, before, before you actually do it. I can move, I can, and you can actually drag these up and around. You can actually move these up in the order you want them to appear in as well. Okay. So um, I think that's good. So now if I hit apply down here, check it out. I now have a GeoGebra app that has fewer tools for students to use instead of the 8,000 that pop up automatically. So the students are going to really hit the slope. They'll be saying, oh, gosh, you know, here, here, you know what I mean? And so, gosh, that that's that's definitely not parallel, right? But again, we're putting the justification on the students. I mean, some teachers have asked me, oh, can you make it in output right and wrong? And I'm like, I... I there are some that do that, but I really prefer not. And the reason why is because um, for, for a problem that requires so much critical thinking on the student's part, I believe that the feedback should not be as immediate. Students should should work through the struggle, if you will, um, if that makes sense. So I'm going to I'm going to take uh, I'm just going to actually delete those for a second. Right there and we'll leave it and we'll kind of leave it. We'll actually leave it like this. OK. We're almost done here. So we got it looking like this. I'm going to put this up here. But now I don't, students don't really need, I want to make sure that I put it above nine. You know what I mean? So I can have it like right there. I can right click on it. I can lock it, right click on it, pin it to the screen. We'll keep it right where it is. But now I want to hide all this stuff, this garbage. They don't need to see that. So to do that, you go to the menu up here. To hide the algebra view on the left side, you go to view and uncheck it. D, just basically click it out. Turns, puts the algebra on, puts it off, right? And now that is kind of like what uh, what we have here to work with. All of these points cannot go beyond nine. They can't go beyond one, uh, beyond one to the left, and they can't go above nine up here. See, we're, we're, we're locked in here, right? And that's the way we, we define it. So now we save it one more time, file, save. If you give it the same name, it'll override the old file. If I change the name even once, it's like a save as. So I'll give it the same name. I'll save it. Saving, it says. Save successfully. In fact, I think I have some, uh, I forgot to delete this stuff in here. Let me just get rid of that and I'll save it one more time. Monique, when we're doing this, are there any questions there? I can't see the platform there, but um, anything? Um. No question specifically about this. Okay. Um, but we did have a comment about uh, how someone really loves that uh, there is a coding aspect to GeoGebra that is um, not all, it's not immediately there for everyone mm -hmm. to use in case that's a little overwhelming for you. Um, you don't need to know how to code in order to make something in GeoGebra. Um, right. But it is a possibility for those who are comfortable with it and would like to unlock the the power of the GeoGebra engine. Absolutely. And and if there are Desmos enthusiasts watching, many of you are used to working in their activity builder where you have elements, where you have multiple elements on the same screen and you have sinks and sources. And so, oh, I'm gonna pull this from this source and we're gonna we're gonna it's gonna sync right into here, right? And so in the Desmos activity builder, the elements on the activity page, they talk to each other, right? Well, in GeoGebra right now, it's a lot simpler. It's like there is in the GeoGebra activity that you create, you can put GeoGebra apps in them, but all of the talking goes on in one app alone. And right now it's not possible to have one app talk to another app, if you will. Okay. So that's kind of how it is, at least in GeoGebra, all the programming is done singly in here. Okay. So uh, right, what we're going to do right now, since we saved it, I'm actually going to X out of this all together. Okay. I'm going to close since I saved it. And now... I, it can be found right in my profile page right here. This is like your Google Drive and GeoDrive. Anything you create, you can, um, you know, it's all in your profile right here. Let's give it a second. All right. OK. 
Okay. Um, oh, am I logged in as me? I think I'm logged in as myself. I. It's weird. I saved it to the. Um, yeah. Hmm. You know what? I, let me just check here for a second. I thought I made it with the GeoGebra Classroom Activities account. Oh, I made it on mine. Okay, so there, see how it's right there? Now, here's what some teachers get confused with. Well, it's like, well, th there's my file, Tim, but the problem is when I open it, I click on it, watch. It's like a view only kind of thing. I can't do anything with it. Where's the toolbar? Where's the directions? Well, and I, I get how that can be confusing, right? It is annoying. But here's what we're gonna do. Here's what to do about it. You go you go to the three dots right here, and this is, when you create a construction in GeoGebra, you actually create a resource or an activity at the same time without realizing it. But right here, if I click on the dots and go to edit activity, right here, now I can actually clean this up and make it look like the way it's supposed to look. So I'm gonna hit this edit pencil right here, okay? And I know it's a ginormous size. This is huge, right? It's like 1680 by whatever. So for small Chromebook screens, you go to advanced settings right down here, small Chromebook screens, I like to make it no bigger than 800 by 600. So I'm going to make that a 600 here. And that width needs that that length needs to go that width needs to go way down. Let's see what it looks like for now. Okay. Not a lot better there. That's at least that that's a lot better that from what I see right there, right? I can move this up a little bit. But now I want to I want to actually show the toolbar. That's like the most important thing that kids need, right? To justify afterwards, you got to have the tools there, right? There they are. And I like to I like to give kids the style bar, so they can make their own colors. Style bar is this little thingy right there. Okay, when I click on an object, I could change the. If I click on that, I could change the color, the parallel, the parallel, the rectangle there. But um, you know what? We can actually enable dragging of labels again. Enable right click and whatever because whatever you have the power to do in the app, you want the students to be able to do as well. Okay, the one thing you don't need right now is the input bar. That's where you. If I I'll show you what happens if I click it. It just makes a little input bar down there, or in the newer apps, it puts the algebra view there, but we, we don't really need that right now, okay? And if I show the menu, the menu is actually uh, the bars right here. You know, if you ever wanted your kids to save their own file and work with it later, they could they could do that, but um, but we'll, we'll keep that off for now. And so now I hit done. Now see, that is how I take uh, something I make in one of the apps and literally like just simply you know, make it something that's kind of smaller and user friendly. Okay. So now I need to actually go into this and just, I need to move it up a little bit. So I'm going to edit the applet. I click edit. Now I'm, I'm editing it just like in the app, like as if I was online. So I'm going to move this down a little bit and I need to move this. Maybe I need to make sure that's a little bit higher because, you know, it's nine, it goes up to nine. I don't want it to get in the way. And let's see. And now I can actually zoom out a little bit, make it a little cleaner. And again, uh, that's good, but we can also we can also squish it even more, bring it up a little bit, make it smaller. That's fine, you know. But but there there's there's a a working uh, this is a good viable working product here, okay. That we can actually work with, okay. So now uh, I'll hit done, and what I could even do is actually add more stuff to this activity. We're gonna do we're gonna create a class in just a few minutes. Monique's gonna lead, and we'll all join, and we'll watch everybody who's who's gonna participate. We'll we'll watch you making your own constructions in real time. Okay, so I'm going to add an element here. I'm going to add a picture, the image there, and I'm going to drag the image that I took from Open Middle Site right there. See it? I could type it in there, but um, that's pretty big right there. So let me actually shrink it to maybe a 500 width. That makes sense. Yeah, that's a lot better. Okay, and I'll just hit done. So, um, I could actually take this and drag it up. You know, right now in GeoGebra, it's just vertical right now. But again, this hopefully will get a cosmetic makeover within the next year. But um, right here, let me make that a little bit bigger. Yeah, so we can see it there. So uh, source, you know, openmiddle.com. And you can actually hyperlink things in here too. You can actually uh, you can actually go right here and actually put um, the source right there. And if I highlight it, I can actually go to text tools and I could put the link to Open Middle's uh, Open Middle site right there. Okay, so give proper credit where credit is due, and there we go. Okay, and I'll make that a little bigger so it's easier to see. So again, make it very big.
and then we're done and uh, we'll call it a day so now I can now I can take this I can save it and close and now my activity is ready to uh, go we could try to put this to the test oh but wait a minute Monique I forgot something here you know what we should actually uh, go back and edit it we should probably we probably should have asked students a question or two right yep. to actually justify why it's a parallelogram so there's the problem let's go at it but then I can add a question right here and say hey um, you know justify uh, you know once you've created your parallel created your parallelogram uh, use the tools of algebra to show why the parallelogram you know they can do it more than one way okay totally so uh, we're done and then now all right we can uh, we can actually by the way you can actually duplicate this check this out if you hit the copy uh, copy button right here you can actually duplicate it and it'll make another one and you could actually uh, edit it and say hey can you create another and then now finally done save and close and at this point we are ready to actually uh, give this as an activity just for students to do oh sorry it'll work now we'll give this for uh, students to uh, an activity for students to do within a geogebra class which i like to call a live lesson all right let's give me a second here it's giving me a hard time uh, there we go. All changes saved. So now we go back. And again, if you ever want to publish an activity, you can go here. You, you have to go here and hit the, the publish icon. That makes it publicly findable. But I'm going to save time and not do it now. But what I will do for everybody here is I'm going to drop in the link to this uh, open middle problem. And let me actually go back to StreamYard. I will stop sharing, I'll stop sharing my screen. And um, I'm actually gonna post it in the comments right there. That was the activity. All right. And so now, um, we'll, what we'll do is we'll create a class from that. So uh, Monique, I'll drop it to you in the, uh, the private chat there. And uh, Monique will screen share, and um, she's going to create a geogebra. We're going to do a geogebra classroom demo here for those of you that haven't seen it yet. So um, get ready to have a little bit of fun. So there's the activity. You can see my screen, right? We can. Yeah. Can you make it a little bit bigger, please? Like 120. That okay, that's good. Okay. So pretty much, uh, as you saw, this is. Uh, I just followed the link um, that. Um, Tim sent and you can see there's the image and there's the the app and the question and theoretically you can just uh, send this link if you want your students if you um, for them to do on their own say for example uh, this is like an optional activity or um, you're just looking at some of the resources and you wanted um, your students to look through it on their own now let's say I wanted to use this though, and I wanted to be able to follow their their work and see what's going on. Like I'm in, uh, I'm a teacher for an entire classroom. Then uh, this is where GeoGebra Classroom comes in really handy. So uh, I am logged into my account right now, um, and what I can do is I can go to the top right button, and it says Create Class. So I am a teacher right now, uh, trying to create a GeoGebra Classroom for my students. Um, and I'm going to adjust the name of this. Um, but I can see, I can take uh, Tim's resource and start a class. And what I can do is GeoGebra will make a custom link for this classroom. So I can either have my students type in this code or I can even create this link, which I Where'd will. you get that from the upper right corner? Can you show yeah, me where that right. link is again? Sure. So I clicked over here, the share button here. You can click on it and it'll let you copy the link. So I'm going to click this button, copy that link, um, and I will share it with everyone uh, to join. Awesome. But 
as you can see, you can actually also, uh, so currently I am the owner of this class, but I can also add a co-teacher. Um, so for example, if I wanted to um, add Tim, I can put his email address or his username. Um, but right so now- the teacher, uh, teacher can see the same uh, the student does. So yeah, would you drop it in the other chat so I can actually access it, please? The private chat on the side. I'll join as a student. Um, so this is what the, the teacher view looks like. And now I'm going to pull another tab open. So now on the right side, you see what the instructor sees. And then on the left, I will uh, go into a student view. So uh, when your students go to the link, um, they'll be prompted to either just enter in their name uh, or they can log into their own account if they have their own account. Um, if they have an account and log into it, uh, their work will actually uh, save. Um, they'll Their names will automatically be inputted. But let's say uh, Bart Simpson decided to enter this class. The Bart's work will not save now because he has not logged into GeoGebra. But if a student, you're saying if a student logs in using their GeoGebra ID, then their work will save to their profile and they can access it at any time. That's correct. And Greg, uh, Greg put some stuff up here. Had some issues today. Not all students' activities would start. Um, Greg, that you know, that's not the first time I heard of it. I mean, again, it's a new feature. Again, the classes do come automatically paused uh, by default. Uh, Monique, as the teacher, does have to hit the uh, the start student work button. Um, but I'm assuming you probably did that. But um, again, this is again very new. Any anytime something new comes down in tech, there's always some unexpected issue that happens, and then we report to the devs. You know that, but um, if you email support at geodra.org, if that still happens, um, they'll jump on it first thing in the morning. I mean, they're in Austria. They're, it's like 3 a.m. there, but they'll be at it bright and early uh, if you still find it um, being a pain in the butt. Yeah, it was totally new today. Absolutely. Um, and the fact that now we have thumbnails that appear for students instead of names, which allows us to uh, do it. So, Monique, we, is it okay if we start working, though? Yeah, Please. so as you can see, I can see the... Uh in my in my instructor view, I can see I have four students in my class right now, and I can start the class and allow you all to start. Cool. Um, and as uh, you uh, you all in my class uh, start to go through this class, um, me as a teacher, I can look at the students in my class and see. Um, I can see some of your progress. I can look at the individual tasks, say, and see if um, anyone has started working on specific applets or specific questions. Can we actually go to task one on the right side, please, as a teacher? Let's check it out. Yeah. So let's see the, the few students that are here tonight. Let's see what we can um, see there. Because uh, I know I've definitely started it. Again, sometimes it's hard to estimate the bandwidth that something like this requires, especially in the 3D realm. Oh, my gosh. It, 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 it was pretty fast. Um, but let's see what's going on here. Here we're not uh, seeing anything, unfortunately. Let's go back a second. Might just take a couple minutes to uh... – that's okay, Greg. Better late than never. <laughs> yeah. So let's go at it here. You know what? It's just might just be slow right now. I mean, um, they're all sleeping in Austria right now. We're not in school right now here in America, at least. But you know, it's um, interesting because honestly, there's some times in the day where it's just like it could once a week for ten minutes. It could like whoops, you know, like and again, stuff like that happens. But whenever it does, rest assured, the devs are always hard at work on that to address it right away. Um, but here, uh, again, this happens less than like one percent of the time. But um, right here, it's there. There we go. Task one going on there. Uh, let's see. Just keep working here, just moving it. But you'll notice here that as you do that, you can use these tools here to um, try to uh, find slopes of the find slopes of those uh, sides, and uh, you know go at it accordingly. It actually might be yeah. my internet because I can see on my students uh, in my student view, it's still or it's not saving for me. Mm -hmm. So, but I can see that uh, Timothy and Luis have been 
are working on task one. Right. Well, that's kind of the, um, you know, the gist of it there. So in essence, you know, Monique, uh, Monique is literally, you know, as a teacher, you could be watching these in real time. You could see all student progress without having them having to take screenshots. Okay. This helps take the stress off and students can still, you can still embrace that open middle concept where students are building. The middle part is open as Robert Kaplinsky said, and you could want be watching all this in real time, which is, it's a lot of fun. Um, but I know we have about uh, 10 minutes to go here, but we, it's okay if we end there a little bit. Now we're starting to get, now, there we go. There we go. Just a little bit, little uh, glitch there. But sometimes teachers find that like, you know, it updates. Oh, usually it's every three seconds, but it might be like 20 or whatever. Again, think about it. I mean, a lot of your students at home who are remote learning, they may have siblings and, you know, parents and guardians may not have wife the greatest bandwidth when it comes to Wi-Fi. So we have to expect that these issues are going to exist, of course, you know, because of the unfortunate inequities that are there. So, um, so yeah, yeah, you're right. Bandwidth does become an issue, Greg. You're absolutely right. Um, totally. And especially when there's five people in a family all on Google Meets with classes and, you know, someone's streaming and whatever from it's, it, it can get that way, you know, so definitely not, uh, not perfect, but this is something that you can do. Um, and to, for those of you that love to create, you know, you might've gotten to see a little bit, you know, what, what you can do with GeoGebra uh, right here. But, um, and if I can, uh, so this is what GeoGebra Classroom really looks like, okay? And uh, now Monique can actually see and have private discussions with students or one-on-one, -on -one, whatever. Um, but there's a lot more features coming to GeoGebra Classroom in the next few weeks. Um, but I have done this, uh, I have done webinars with like over 400 teachers, like, you know, with this, and we were all working in 3D and man, those things were changing like crazy. So it's a powerful engine, it really is. So, um, but you could take advantage of, of the fact here. So, um, Monique, can you actually show people, especially who are, who haven't seen this so much before, can, um, if we go back, where do we find our class? If you were to exit out of that browser window as a teacher, where do you go back and find your class? Yeah. Uh, let's say I closed out of where is uh, the student? That, yeah. that tab. Um, whether I am a student or a teacher, I can just go to geogebra.org. Um, and if I'm logged in, I can just go to my profile. So as a teacher, I can just go to my profile and I can see the class right here. Nice. And go back into it. And as a student, it, and as a student, it's the same thing. So some teachers have asked me now, could you hit the pause button for a second? Uh, if you hit the pause button, right, you can't work anymore. Some teachers, if you don't want your students working outside of class, just leave it paused and close it down, be done for the day, right? There's nothing, you could totally do that. I mean, if classes are if classes now are created with it paused, you have to hit start student work. You could totally end the class with it paused as well, all right? Um, and so obviously, you go ahead and let's resume it in case some people want to keep working there. But the other thing too is you could also hide the names as well. If we hide names, maybe uh, teachers you want to facilitate a class discussion with different responses to questions, you can show all these responses and nobody um, nobody knows who did what. You know, I think in Desmos they do like mathematician names. It's really cool. But here, right now, student one, student two. Who knows? Maybe we'll do something like that. I have no idea. But um, the point is. Um, Again, a lot of these uh, amazing uh, advances in edtech platforms just really excites me. I think it's awesome. And so uh, there we have it. We can look up close at student five's work right there and just simply see. Now, um, Monique, is it okay if I uh, show something else really quickly? Yeah. Because as a teacher, right, we may want to actually uh, create uh, an analog of this, if you will. So let me just um, show you what I mean. I'm gonna share my screen. Last thing before we go. You may, you may look at this and say, you know what? Oh, let me get out of here. You may actually look at uh, this. Let me go back to GeoGebra. And we'll go back to our profile here. You know, if you think, of, if, you, if, you really, if you really think about it, there are several analogs of problems that I could truly create from this right here, right? Now, we asked kids to make a parallelogram, did we not? But what's stopping us from making a version of this to say, let's try to make a rectangle. How about we basically uh, make it a square instead? You know what I mean? 
we could create different versions of this problem. So all you have to do here, if you ever find something in GeoGebra that you like, but you want to make a couple changes, like you don't want to change the, the making of the app inside of it, but you just want to just maybe change the directions or change some wording or whatever. Maybe you want to translate it into a different language. If that's, if that's your case, all you need to do is go here and select copy activity, right? What do you do with a Google Doc that someone sends you, but you can't mess with it? You make a copy for yourself. Same logic here. So copy the activity. And see how it says copy of, just like Google does? So now I could change this to uh, creating rectangles. And then basically I'll get rid of this, and then I'll put the directions in here. I would put directions in here and change it to ask my students to be making a rectangle instead. Again, digits one through nine cannot repeat, so therefore this is going to be out. But again, we have to show that you know slopes of uh, uh, of adjacent sides of each pair of adjacent sides are opposite reciprocals, right? And I can hit done and um, save it and close it. And now I just create a brand new one. And un unfortunately, the workflow issue it is going to change here. But right now, when I hit save and close the copy that I made. It brings me back to the original, which I don't want. I want my copy. So if I go back to GeoGebra up here, go back to my profile, I will see creating rectangles. I can make a copy of that, right? And I can make it an activity where kids have to make a square. I could do a trapezoid, an isosceles trapezoid. You see what I mean? The possibilities here are absolutely endless. So just because we, we made one template here, now we can actually copy the activity multiple times and create different versions of different activities isosceles trapezoid you name it ask kids to kite ask kids to build it okay so um that kind of is uh, that i know we have about uh, another three or four minutes left but we're going to have another webinar about this not next week because it is the wednesday before thanksgiving here in the united states but um on wednesday december 2nd from 8 to 9 p.m eastern 5 to 6 p.m uh central i'm sorry pacific We'll do another open middle webinar we'll, where we will create a problem like Robert showed us, where kids have to, you know, type in some digits into boxes to create uh, the maximum largest product or sum or whatever like that. So we'll definitely learn how to use more input boxes with GeoGebra in working there. So um, if there's any other questions, feel free to type them in. We'll be happy to answer it. But that's all we had for yeah. this evening. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's something really quick that maybe we can show just as we're wrapping up. Huh. Go for it. Uh, let's see. So Greg asked if uh, we could change the line value. So uh, remember in your applet, just changing the from one unit to say something like a little bit different. Okay, I guess, well, um, how do you change the line values from one unit? Oh, oh, I could show you that. Sure. Um, yeah. Is it scaling the axis? You mean? I think, yeah, we could. We could. Yeah, we could and just changing things like the label, scaling the axes. Yeah. So let me let me share the screen um, here. Well, it's what's we'll that question? Great question, Greg. Totally great question. So we'll go back to GeoGebra Classic here, or any app will do. GeoGebra.org. Uh, we'll go to the we'll go to the the newer the calculator suite here. Again, very powerful app, just like the Classic, just looks different. But if you ever want to change this, let me just make it bigger so it's easy for you all to see. I'll make it like super big like that. Okay. So if you ever want to change the axis, the labels and stuff, if I right click and go to settings, um, you can go to the X axis and really all the magic happens right here. So I don't even like the text, but I can label it uh, seconds here. Um, I can do I can do a lot of different things here. See what I mean? like seconds is there and I could say uh, I can go up to the go here settings axes y axis uh, where it says label maybe I'll put uh, distance or displacement or displacement over time whatever but you can scale uh, accordingly here in anything in fact if you even work with trigonometry trigonometric functions if you ever want to see this whole distance thing people get confused with if I zoom out it's going to get 0, 5, 10, then it's going to be 0, 10, 20, whatever. But if you ever want to like lock the, turn off the automaticity, you just go here, go to settings and do that. So for example, right here, if I can even, I can even for trig graphs, I can lock it at pi over seven, just type pi for pi. Look at this. If I do that, literally, it will, uh, let me just zoom out. 
See, now that's kind of crazy. But if I zoom in enough, let's say the period was 4 pi over 7, right? And I had no horizontal shift. I could actually do just that. Or I can go back and change it to, say, pi over 17. As ugly as that is, it, you can do anything, right? It's pretty, it's pretty powerful. So, uh, but that's how you can kind of sort of do uh, things like that. And in the newer app, um, with point labels especially, you take it, the style bar appears next to the point. Like in the classic app, it's up here with a box that pops up. But in the newer apps, you touch it, you can actually uh, change uh, properties of it literally right over here. And just kind of go with it that way. You could change the rounding, of course, uh, in here. But that's, uh, there's other webinars that kind of deal with, uh, with that. Let's make it two. It's much nicer and cleaner. But, yeah. So there you go. It's nine. It's uh, nine o'clock. So uh, Eastern time, six Pacific. So we're gonna say uh, adios, and we'll see you back in two weeks. Thank you so much for watching. And uh, if you have any questions, you can always email uh, me with how tos at timichiojbra.org. Uh, and so uh, we have a lot of exciting things coming in the next few months. So uh, put on social media. Stay tuned for that. Thanks again. Have a great evening. Have a great morning, and take care. Thank you.